I do make no apology whatsoever for, for, for the pun. Um, as will become clear, this is a paper about sausages. It's, it's a paper about Germany, anti-German sentiment, Germanophobia, and its intersections with um, public health. Um, and as we were discussing just before I, I started, this is particularly uh, salient given recent uh, news about Tesco's and the identification of, of what we might be seeing. I think it was phrased in one bit, inappropriate amounts of, of horse meat in, in some of their <laughs> value products, um, which is going to be particularly interesting when I, when I come on to talk about the composition of some of the uh, sausages that I'm talking about. Now, in May 2009, the World Food, for food Organization's food science or food safety scientist, Peter Embarak, explained how increased surveillance of pigs was necessary after the flying, swine flu virus was detect, detected in Canadian livestock. Some countries had already responded to the fear, feared swine flu pandemic with a precautionary slaughter, but more common was the introduction of discriminatory measures against Mexican pork. Now, in the um, wake of BSE, so you can see some of these uh, concerns being arrested about uh, swine flu. I particularly like the uh, Christopher uh, Robin declaring uh, poo, uh, so poo that piglet has to be put down. Uh, in the wake of uh, BSE, however, these um, responses should not be seen as surprising in terms of how public health fears are being translated onto national food products, making them into a source of fear particularly the fear surrounding British beef. Yet it's possible to go back even further and see a similar range of responses also existing in the 19th century. Now, although the use of foodstuffs as signals of national identity has a long history, in the 19th century, connections between food and nation took on new associations, as certain national foodstuffs became associated with the spread of disease. So mid-Victorian debates on tea adulteration focused on dirty Chinamen. And Italian ice cream then became linked to outbreaks of typhoid. While between 1879 and 1881, Italy, Germany, Austria-Hungary, France, Turkey and Greece all imposed restrictions on the importation of American pork and pork products, ostensibly because of concerns about high levels of trichinosis and its risks to human health. Now, such concerns about national foodstuffs and disease need to be seen in the context of growing contemporary fears about food quality and food safety. But by the 1880s, it was the dangers of eating meat from diseased livestock that was arousing particular expert and public alarm and dominated debate about food and disease. Now, a series of what the veterinary record called dead meat dramas served to focus anxiety on the dangers of eating diseased meat as local authorities stepped up their efforts to prevent the sale of meat deemed unfit for human consumption. Now, part of a network of food scares that shaped attitudes to food safety, selling diseased meat came to be represented as, quote, excuse me, constructive murder. Fears that, quote, there was no telling how many lives might be sacrificed from eating such meat were made more acute by the symbolic and nutritional importance ascribed to meat and the perceived threat to the bodies of the poor who could only ever afford the cheapest cuts. Um, particularly in terms of the, of the symbolic value of meat around ideas of John Bull and, and the roast beef of Old England. These are very potent signifiers of British identity. Now, as more and more um, butchers and sausage makers were prosecuted for trading in diseased meat, local cases were reported with increasing shrillness to a newspaper readership fascinated with sensational and grotesque stories. Now, if cases before local magistrates represented only a very small proportion of the meat seized by medical officers of health, not all meat deemed unfit for human consumption was viewed by contemporaries as the same. It was the sausage that was seen as presenting the gravest threat to health from diseased meat. And debates about the dangerous sausage became emblematic of many of the issues surrounding food quality and the risks from diseased meat. So you can, you can see here this, this idea of the dangers of the exploding sausage 
um, particularly exploding from, thing, uh, from uh, the putrefactive changes going on within it. Yet, while all types of sausages were increasingly viewed with sedition, not all sausages were identical in the fears they aroused. In newspaper reports, in medical journals, and in court cases, German sausages were singled out, and here's your pun, as versed than the others, more prone to harbouring putrid or diseased meat, and for spreading more disease than any other meat product in the world. However, alarm went beyond German sausages as unfit for human consumption, as they came to be used metaphorically in expressions of Britain's ongoing love-hate relationship with Germany, or increasingly after 1870, hate relationship with Germany. Between 1850 and the First World War, German sausages were used in expression of anti-German sentiment as apprehension about Germany and German immigrants merged with anxieties about food and disease. Although German sausages were not the only national foodstuffs to be associated with disease, and the dietary practices of other nations, particularly the French, were criticised, German sausages became bundles of ingredients that inquired bundles of meaning that came to stand in as representative objects for Germany, anti-German sentiment, and the dangers of diseased meat. So in this paper, what I want to do is explore these connections. So drawing on medical debates and press representations, I want to examine how material objects were not only employed in national stereotypes, but also how sausages were used symbolically to voice fears about Germany, and how German sausages became something in themselves to be feared. Now, although the, the sausage was no Victorian culinary invention, in the 19th century, sausages became an essential component of many working-class diets and also of many fast food stalls. In an environment where most meat was cooked in a frying pan, sausages were an ideal and convenient food. Immigration and culinary transfer saw new types of sausages introduced into Britain, British diets, but essentially they formed cheap food for hungry souls and offered a savoury flavour for those who could seldom afford to have meat. Now, although the, this association with cheap food and poor diets persisted, in the second half of the 19th century, all types of sausages grew in increasing popularity. They were progressively appearing on the tables of middle-class families and were even mentioned as suitable hors d'oeuvres at modest dinner parties. But they were present in other ways. The sausage was a feature of numerous contemporary novels, often as a descriptive term, but they were also culturally visible in other ways. They were evident in the knowing culture of music hall songs, uh, particularly I Didn't Raise My Dog to Be a Sausage, and even appeared in various uh, board games. But they were also used in political satires and in descriptions of other nations. Now, food was used to confer identities on different national and immigrant groups, from the German sausage and the Spanish onion to the roast beef of Old England, in what might be seen as a form, or as a form of culinary or gastro-nationalism. As Rogers explains in Beef and Liberty, after language, food is the most important bearer of national identity. And this is particularly true of meat and meat products because of their symbolic and almost luxury value. Now, while it's important not to overstate the connections between food, national identity and national stereotypes, national meat dishes was were used as symbols in broader nationalist discourses and became, in many senses, potent sources of xenophobia. Now, contrary to popular perceptions, Victorian Britain was not a racially tolerant nation. Now, if this is most visibly present in the violent protests directed against various immigrant groups, from the Irish to the Chinese, it was also evident in press hostility, in racial slurs, and in xenophobic utterances that played on notions of British superiority. Sausages were used in these discourses and acquired particular association with the German states and then after 1871 with the newly unified Germany. Now, although the German immigrant group um, in Britain, which reached its peak in the 1890s, predominantly settled in London, until 1891, Germans represented the largest minority population in Britain. 
Merchants and entrepreneurs constituted the most important occupational group in terms of numbers and influence. But many German immigrants moved into the food and catering trade and became an important component in the provision of meat. Some 1,200 German butchers were reported to be in business between 1881 and 1911. And given the small size of the German immigrant community, many of these butchers cater for local and non-immigrant communities, and German butchers became very prominent in the sausage trade. They introduced a variety of sausages into Britain, ensuring that the German sausage became the most visible German influence on British diet. And in some senses, if you actually look at the racial disturbances at the start of the First World War, many of which targeted German butchers and then to a lesser state German bakers, it's almost possible to argue that in some senses the, the German sausage and the German meat producer might have been the most visible influence on, on British diets and also um, Britain's sense of what um, a local German immigrant was doing. Now, by the mid-19th century, clear connections were made between the German nation and diet that mowed much the importance of food for German immigrant communities, the visibility of sausages in German diets, and the role of German immigrants in the meat trade. As Mademoiselle explained to Fraulein in a short story published in the Longman magazine in 1904, the Germans were by nature, quote, a sausage-loving people. For the writer Hawthorne, nothing is more peculiarly national than the German sausage, a sentiment that was widely echoed in the press. Connections between Germany, sausages, and the sausage-eating propensity of the Germans became uh, commonplace as a racial stereotype of Germans that stressed the link between nation, diet, and sausages. The association was seldom sympathetic. It became a vehicle not only for satirising Germany, but also as an expression of anti-German feeling. Although anti-German sentiment didn't result in violence against German immigrants until 1914, less violent forms of Germanophobia intensified in the second half of the 19th century, as Germany was increasingly perceived as an economic and imperial rival. Sausages were employed in these anti-German discourses, as, as, you, as you can see here. Um, I, I particularly like the, the, the versed family. Um, and these are often stereotyping Germany as uncouth, brutish, immoral, and poor. For example, Germans were considered so unromantic that they sent their sweetheart not flowers on Valentine's, but Strasbourg sausages. When speaking about German princes, Fun Magazine commented in 1886, some sausages are thick, some are fat. It's just the same with the German princes. Some Ger German sausages are made of jackass, are they? Some German princes are being so without being made. Now, from attacks on German princes as sausage-bloated royal paupers in the 1840s to concerns about competition after 1880, the sausage stereotype proved popular with satirists, radicals and journalists as a symbol for German greed, provincialism and boorishness. I should have checked if there was any Germans in the audience, shouldn't I, really, <laughs> at this point. Um, moving quickly on. Uh, so anti-German sentiment was even more visible in representations of international affairs. So Punch's Anti-Sausage League, which satirised Prussia's ambitions, was widely copied in the provincial press. Now, if this was a, a fairly benign in its representation of pre-unification Germany as little German sausages, following the Franco-Prussian War, the German sausage was increasingly presented as a threat as Germanophobia took on a new intensity to reflect growing anxiety about Germany's economic and imperial strength and competition with Britain. This is evident, for example, in expressions uh, in relation to the Spanish colonial aspirations in, in 1885, uh, where Germany, or the, the big German sausage, is seen as suppressing the Spanish um, onion. And it's also seen even more potently in Germany's ambitions in South Africa. Nor was this link just made in the popular or satirical press. When Kaiser Wilhelm visited London in 1891, the crowd was reported to have been abusive, shouting at one point, we don't want any German sausages here. 
as they protested against German support for the Boers. While it's, unhard to, while it's hard to unpick the influence of the, German, of the sausage stereotype on popular perceptions of Germany or German immigrants, the frequency with which it was used across the political spectrum suggests that it offered a metaphor that was very widely understood. As the Birmingham Post explained in 1887, it became something of a stale and thrashed out joke to refer to Germans as German such sausages. Such was the ubiquity of the term. On the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, the association of Germany with aggression and sausages was visibly present. Germany was both a sausage-eating nation and an aggressive one. And I, and I particularly like the, the national cookery recipe of how to cook a German sausage. So you've got the recipe there for, for success during wartime. Now, if the sausage was a, a regular feature of German stereotypes and attacks on Germany, another dimension can be detected. Sausages were not simple objects in the 19th century, but they were themselves the focus of increasing alarm. Although, regrettably, there's no such thing that I've discovered yet as sausophobia. Now, if the sausage never became the focus of a particular food scare in the same way as milk, beer or imported meat did, they were regularly used to remind readers of the risks from eating certain foods. Now, what went into sausages had long been a target for humorists. But as the medical journal, British Medical Journal explained in 1899, quote, the individual endowed with the average amount of caution exists a genuine distrust of them. Sausages were seldom what they seemed with medical officers of health, journalists and social commenters presenting them as highly dangerous food. Reports by sanitary officials emphasised how the proportion of meat in the average sausages was low, how they regularly contained a number of unexpected ingredients from buttons to cloth and other, quote, equally dubious material. Yet it was not the threat from foreign substances that generated alarm. The main source of fear was the meat being used. Now, if the more squeamish avoided commenting on the precise composition of, medical, uh, of many sausages, quote, for the obvious reason that it's not warranted to be formed of the flesh of any particular domestic animal, sausages were feared to contain ve uh, various taboo meats, much like Tesco's, notably horse flesh, cat and dog meat. If this wasn't enough, Sausages were seen to exist at the very bottom of the meat industry, harbouring meat that was putrid or had come from pigs, sheep, cows and horses that had died from disease. As the journal Public Health explained, meat that was, quote, too bad to be sold in the ordinary way was regularly worked up into sausages. As for many butchers, sausages were merely a convenient means of getting rid of meat which could not be sold in its crude form. Evidence that sausages contained a significant proportion of diseased, putrid, stinking and maggoty meat was regularly reported, usually in the, in the hundreds of tons being seized. There was even a language to describe such meat. Slinked veal, staggering bobs and tibbies were used to produce imitation pork sausages, while screw beef was reportedly used in the manufacture of other types of sausages. The amount of diseased meat that went into sausages was considered to be produced by sanitary officials and commentators felt that it was a certainty that most sausages f contained some form of putrid or diseased meat. Now such sausages were not just an offence to the sense of taste. Ideas of taste and notions of what is good and bad to eat are culturally determined. But in the 19th century, notions of good and bad meat were also being shaped by medical ideas. Now, although the narrative of Sweeney Todd and Mrs. Lovett's pies reflected fears about the vulnerability of urban foodstuffs and the dangers of adulteration in the 1840s, the sale of diseased meat surfaced as a public health issue in the 1850s. If the meat trade had always been seen as a notorious source of nuisances, as retail meat prices climbed and the levels of contagious disease in livestock rose after 1850, fears about the increasing quantity of meat considered only fit to be buried that was sold focused concern. By the 1870s, the systematic sale of diseased meat was believed to be, quote, so common a practice that it was not, as the sanitary record bemoaned, looked upon as a crime. 
Such claims were no doubt an example of journalistic exaggeration, but the problem was viewed as a very real one. Commentators pointed to how individual markets were overwhelmed with diseased meat. So, for example, Moore Street Meat Market in Glasgow was, according to the Glasgow Her Herald, quote, a receptacle for doubtful and diseased meat from every part of Scotland, with much of the meat sold there viewed as little more than a shade above carrion. Now, although the epidemiological significance of meat-borne disease remained very minimal, the sense that enormous quantities of diseased meat found its way onto markets and butcher shops focused medical debate on the dangers of meat from diseased livestock against a background of concern about adulteration and contamination of foodstuffs. With rising meat consumption would improve standards of living, a proliferation of markets such as seen here, street stalls and butchers, worries about the visceral horrors of the slaughterhouse and reports about the widespread sale of diseased meat all focus concerns and encourage the connections to be made between meat from diseased livestock and illness that went beyond a sense that some meat was dangerous simply because it had become putrid. <clears throat> Epidemic outbreaks of rinderpest in cattle only heightened, heightened anxiety, simulating a series of medical and veterinary investigations into the dangers of animal diseases um, and the relationships of animal diseases to man as part of wider interest in the nature of contagion. Whereas in the 1860s, it had been hard to prove um, the danger from eating the flesh of diseased animals. In the 1870s, evidence from experimental studies on rabies, glanders, anthrax encouraged the idea that many diseases common to man and lower animals were communicable from one to the other. A growing body of medical opinion, informed first by pathological studies and then by bacteriological research, argued that putrid and diseased meat was prejudicial to your health. But it was evidence that bovine tuberculosis was contagious that formalised the link between animals, meat, disease and man. Increasingly, diseased meat came to be synonymous with tuberculous meat, with the relationship between disease in man and in livestock seemingly confirmed by Robert Cox's discovery of the tubercular bacillus in 1882 and his claims that, quote, bovine tuberculosis is identical with human tuberculosis and is thus a disease transmissible to man through food, primarily meat and milk. Now, building on this evidence and subsequent bacteriological experiments, Claims were made that tuberculosis, which was one of the most feared uh, diseases of the second half of the 19th century, um, these links between tuberculosis and the butcher's stall were increasingly being asserted. The result that was throughout the 1880s and 1890s, it was increasingly accepted that certain animal diseases could cross the species barrier, that organizations or organisms found in meat could cause illness, and that, as the Saturday record explains, people who ate flesh in a state of disease were likely to catch the disease. Now, in, in these debates, the sausage was identified as a key source of concern, not just breakfast sausages as satirised here, but all types of sausages. As Thomas Wally, principal of the Royal Dick Veterinary College in Edinburgh, an author of A Practical Guide to Meat Inspection, explained, of all diseased meats sold, the amount of danger is very small indeed, as compared with that which exists um, in the consumption of sausages. At the very least, it was felt that eating sausages made from putrid or diseased meat could cause diarrheal disorders, but sausages were implicated in the spread of typhoid, in tuberculosis and in other contagious diseases. The discovery in 1865 that the parasitic disease trichinosis often referred to as the flesh worm disease by contemporaries, can infect man, made pork sausages potentially dangerous. In the 1880s and 1890s, a growing body of research on food poisoning equally suggested that sausages were responsible for numerous outbreaks um, of food poisoning. Studies of paratyphoid, for example, showed that the bacilli could, quote, occur with considerable frequency in food of various kinds especially sausages. 
Now, fears that sausages harboured putrid or diseased meat drew on a sense that the composition of most sausages, and hence the risk, was unknown. Chum, a weekly illustrated paper for boys, reinvented Bismarck's challenge of a duel to the pathologist Rudolf Verkro. In Chum's reimagined account, Verkro presented Bismarck with two large sausages. On doing so, Verkro is reported to have explained one of the sausages is filled with trachea and is deadly. The other is perfectly wholesome. Externally, they can't be told apart. Now, although Chumsey's intention was comic, the short article pointed to the difficulties faced by consumers and, more importantly, sanitary officials in uh, recognising the concealed dangers sausages contained. Sausage manufacturers relied upon a number of processes to disguise the presence of putrid or diseased meat, Meat was often steeped in chemicals or boiled and then minced with spices or smoked to mask the favour. Unscrupulous manufacturers mixed diseased and putrid meat with good meat or would pour fat from healthy carcasses over diseased meat, uh, a process referred to as polishing, to give it the pretense of healthiness. In such cases, as the journal Public Health commented, the detection of disease is often difficult. The, um, the result was uh, that those eating sausages could ingest under a, a pleasant disguise some very disagreeable matter. What made matters much worse was that it was feared that such diseased meat found its way not only into poor homes, which was bad enough, but far more frighteningly onto the dining tables of the rich in the disguise of the well-seasoned sausage. In the face of this evidence, Sanitary officials marvelled how the consumption of sausages, quote, was not signif uh, signified by a marked increase in the death rate in those localities where the demand for them was greatest. By the 1890s, even comic journals like Illustrated Chips warned readers to beware of sausages. <clears throat> so how then does nation fit into this growing fear about the potential of sausages to transmit or cause disease? Now, British sausages were increasingly represented as uh, important objects of concern when it came to food and disease. Commentators felt, perhaps unsurprisingly, that European sausages were more likely to contain diseased meat and were hence of a much greater danger to health. Now, though, although the manufacture of sausages was not an exclusive preserve of German butchers, the German sausage and German sausage makers were attacked more frequently and more vigorously in the press, in magistrates' court and by sanitary officials than any other type of sausage or sausage maker. The attention directed at them was disproportionate to the number of German butchers and the sheer volume of attacks and legal cases involving German sausages and German sausage makers illustrates the link between how the sausage was used in representations of Germany popular anti-German sentiments and concerns about honesty and the threat of Germany and German sausage and German sausage makers to health. If it's often hard to tell whether this was directed at sausage manufacturers who were German or butchers who just happened to produce German sausages, evidence does suggest that German sausages and German sausage manufacturers were regularly blamed for spreading contagion as part of growing uh, Germanophobia. Now, notwithstanding the popularity of the German sausage and leading German delicatessens, links were made between Germans and dishonesty. As part of this association, it was widely believed that the average German sausage contained, quote, deadly mysteries, which were concealed by their smoked and spicy character. Rather than su uh, suggesting conservative tastes, Evidence does in fact point to the, the fact that many people in the 19th century did happen to like their, their food very spicy, or pointing to simple anxiety about adulteration. These concerns concentrated on what went into sausages and the subsequent risk to health. As the Preston Guardian noted, the intellect of man staggers before the problem of what a German sausage may contain. German sausages were widely suspected of containing horse flesh or diseased uh, or dog meat as symbolised particularly in, in debates about German um, um, sausages 
and also immigration and their composition, um, particularly as seen in, in The Secret of German Sausages here, where you get that interchange between dishonest Chinamen and German sausage manufacturers. As Judy magazine quipped, <coughs> I have to give my vote for this because it's my, my, one of my, my favourite all-time quips. I love my slice of German, I adore my cheap polony, but never dreamed my luxuries were donkey, uh, dog and pony. More worrying, German sausage makers were commonly identified as the main culprits in the sale of unwholesome food and were regularly prosecuted for using putrid or diseased meat. For example, in, Germany, in Birmingham, a German meat manufacturer was charged in <coughs> 1881 with making sausages from rotten horse flesh, two horribly diseased sheep and a can of red okra. Well, a German sausage maker in Liverpool explained, what's very bad indeed, we make into Savilars and Germans. <clears throat> My poor German accent coming out there. Evidence in medical journals demonstrated just how dangerous German sausages could be. For example, the British Medical Journal carried a report in 1855 from a Swansea doctor about a case of a fine little boy who had died three hours after eating a German sausage. This was not an isolated incident. Further deaths were reported where German sausages were implicated. Now, nor was this alarm limited to the medical press. In a fictitious conversation in the very popular magazine Once a Week, the more knowledgeable speaker commented, in all, probability, that German, in all probability, that German sausage is made from putrid meat. You may always suspect bad meat where there is a high seasoning, and there are hundreds of instances on record of people rotting away at their extremities from eating these putrid German sausages. High levels of trichinosis in, in Germany directed attention, uh, directly associated German meat uh, with German meat, and particularly German sausages with disease. This led once a week to inform us readers, beware of German sausages as they would beware of an assassin. Now concern peaked in the 1880s at the height of debate about the dangers posed by sausages and against the background of high levels of German immigration, particularly German immigration into the catering trade. Newspapers across Britain carried almost weekly revelations of diseased meat that went into German sausages, and there was an upsurge in the number of diseased meat cases brought before magistrates that involved German sausage makers. Although regulating the meat trade proved very problematic, practical measures were taken by some councils to protect consumers. So, for example, in 1881, Hackney Council appointed extra food inspectors to prevent the manufacture of unwholesome German sausages following reports that diseased horse flesh was used in their production. Seizures of diseased meat and German sausages suspected of harbouring diseased meat rose dramatically. More generally, whereas magistrates were felt to show, quote, a remarkable disinclination to exercise full powers they possess of passing a sentence of imprisonment for those caught selling diseased meat or even disease English sausages. German sausage manufacturers were not so fortunate. When caught, they were more likely than any other sausage manufacturer, no matter what their nationality, to be prosecuted or imprisoned or given a very high fine. And the fines could be considerable. So, for example, in Liverpool, an atrocious diseased meat case involving a German sausage maker resulted in a £100 fine, where often English sausage makers would be fined normally about £10. That's a considerable amount of money. While in Bradford, the magistrate sentenced a German manufacturer to three months hard imprisonment, where in the uh, same week an English sausage maker was let off merely with a, with a warning. Now, these attacks should not be seen as surprising. After 1870, opposition to German immigration focused on their supposed influx into the catering trade, which produced a surge in popular expressions of anti-German feeling that gave voice to much deeper anti-German sentiment and concerns about Germany's imperial aspirations. The press started to assume, as Charles Dickens's All Year Round explained in 1883, the adjective German is in English commerce, the synonym for bad, as, for instance, German sausages. 
The Preston Guardian responded to the conviction of a German sausage manufacturer, suggesting that the man shouldn't have been fined but horsewhipped before being sent to prison. Such was the abominable nature of his crimes. <clears throat> Now, the hostility expressed by the Preston Guardian was more than Charles Osborne's music hall complaints about swarms of foreigners everywhere. It focused Germanophobia on the behaviour of German sausage manufacturers. But as I've tried to show, it was not an isolated view. If reports about German sausages and their manufacturers could not uh, rival the horrific revelations that came to be associated with the Chicago meatpacking industry in 1906 and the attacks that followed on the importation of American uh, meat and meat products into Britain, fears about the threat from diseased meat and sausages combined in the German sausage. This fear gave expression to what might be seen as mounting Germanophobia uh, anti-Germanophobia or mounting Germanophobia, which increases noticeably from the 1870s onwards, particularly in the context of international affairs, but also in the sense of Germany's impact on Britain and the threat it posed. Contemporaries were clear that German sausages and German sausage manufacturers were worse than the others by the simple fact that they were German. German sausage makers did face comparatively heavy fines and appeared to have been targeted by sanitary authorities far more than any other meat um, producer. But there is little evidence to suggest that German sausage makers were driven out of business. Most of those caught did actually continue to go on to trade, which sort of makes you wonder that, that actually fines of £100 are not sufficient to prevent German um, immigrants or German sausage makers from, from trading. Nor were attacks on German sausages regrettably translated into, uh, onto patterns of consumption. And you can actually see this right the way across the spectrum uh, when there are a number of celebrated cases in Glasgow surrounding the production of diseased uh, meat. Uh, this is extensively reported in the Glasgow Herald. Um, meat consumption doesn't dip at all through any of the markets. So it seems that all of these debates actually have little impact on people's dietary um, practices, which, which obviously for a paper like this is immensely disappointing. <laughs> German sausages, just like cheap and adulterated bread, milk, tea and other processed food, continue to be eaten, particularly by the poor, notwithstanding the fears generated by expert opinion that they were injurious to health. And this raises all sorts of questions about the relationship between medical knowledge, sanitary advice, diet and people's dietary um, practices. Food consumption, it might be then, is shaped more by material concerns, by standards of violent living and by dynastic technology than it was by press reports and fears uh, um, they engendered about food and disease. Stomach time upset seemed to be just too ordinary and trivial to warrant serious alarm or action, while cheapness often outweighed concerns about the risks from adulterated foods and diseased meat and diseased meat um, products, which you can sort of see in contemporary debate or relatively contemporary debates about BSE and the ongoing purchase of British beef. We may well be seeing this in, in the consequence of uh, Tesco's and uh, food production. I've just realised that this is being recorded and I, I now could be done for <laughs> defaming Tesco's and well, like three or four occasions during, during the paper. Um, the, the, the comment this might make no impact on their sales should be reassuring to them. <laughs> so it seems to be in many senses that cheapness often outweighed concerns and the nature of people's diets proved much more resilient to medical and press debates about uh, diseased food. But, in terms of newspaper reports, legal cases and evidence from medical officers of health and social commentators, the German hot sausage was con increasingly presented as a bigger threat to digestion and health as the German nation was to British and, uh, and imperial interests. And in many ways, you can see through some of the debates I've been trying to um, talk about how the German sausage stat is, is used to stand in for Germany, the overlapping of concerns, fears about food, fears about nation and public health, and how these are pray, uh, played out in a range of stereotypes, in a range of public health activities, 
to regulate, often unsuccessfully, the food supplies. So that in many ways, the German sausage becomes something extremely dangerous as, as medical officer health and sanitary officials try to clean up the meat trade and in particular target Germans in doing so. So thank you very much and I hope I haven't put you off your dinner. Yeah.